Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for our weekly Sabbath School Recap. We have an enlightening and also thought-provoking uh, lesson this week in some areas. My name is Destin Hazel, and I'm going to be going through this lesson with my right. Sister Rena Hutchinson, and I'm doing Monday's lesson and a course thing in the camp. Linda. <laughs> Um, doing Tuesday lesson, the heart of Judas. I am doing Wednesday and Thursday lesson. My name is Maurice Hall. All right, great. And I'll be the one starting out with Sabbath afternoon and Sunday. So before we begin, let us say a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come here to delve into your word and learn more about you. I pray that this lesson as we go through it, not all not only enlighten us, but help us to turn to you in the things that it's talked about. Give us clarity of mind and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the title of this one is the lesson is Beware of Covetousness. And this is lesson nine, continuing in this quarter's Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And the memory text is taken from Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And it says, Take heed. Beware of covetousness. One's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possess. Now, if you ask many nowadays, they will say it definitely does. Well, let's go into the lesson. Covetousness has been defined as an ordinate desire for wealth or possessions that really don't belong to you. Covetousness is a big deal, big enough fact to be right up there with lying, stealing, and murder. It's so damaging that God chose to warn against it in his great moral law. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is within thy neighbor's. Covetousness is frequently listed with heinous sins that we will keep that will keep us out of the kingdom of God and this continues on to us on Sunday's lesson and there's a question that often arises and understandable understandably so and how sin arose in God's universe so well, this just, is just just before you mm -hmm. you touch that thought brother this thing sure, I, no problem. I just want to just elaborate just a liquor and the memory text. Sure, no problem. Take heed and the wear of covetousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just like to get the picture. You know, I like to drop back on what, what was the real scenario why Christ did really use this statement. What was the statement was all about? Uh, if you look on Luke 12 verses, let me just look at 13. Mm -hmm. There it said, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So if you notice, it was a land dispute with family. Right? And, and he said unto them, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? So if you notice then and now, we still have this land problem. You understand me? Nothing changed under the sun. And Christ is warning us today, us as Christians, that we should take heed and beware of covetousness. We should not try to grudge the other brother for what he have. We should encourage him along the way. And as you say that, Brother Hall, you know, covet covetousness played a major part in original sin in heaven. That's true. Now, that is so true. When brother. we look at Isaiah 14, uh, chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, the question is asked, what hints are about the fall of Lucifer? And how did covetousness play a role, a crucial role in the fall? And let me just go through that quickly with you. It says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art cut down to the ground which this weakened the nation? For thou had said in thine heart, 
I will ascend into heaven. I will exact my throne above the star of God. I will also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So when we look at that, we can see definitely covetousness plays a part there. Because what did Lucifer really and truly based on this? What did he want? He need worship. He need the throne of God. Remember, Lucifer is the creature. God is the creator. And the creature need the creator position. Man, I tell you. I can't see nothing more than that. Bye. Okay, Sister Ochi, I if see I you have a point add, to make. If I may add, um, Lucifer. Lucifer was the leading archangel in heaven. But pride filled his heart. True. And, and he wanted exaltation. Lucifer wanted to be God. He wants homage. He, 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 he wants worship. And hence he lead a revolt against the Most High God. You know, and, and, and we know the story well that one third of the angels of heaven was fallen with Lucifer. And, and just to add just a little bit more is that he was head over all the angels in heaven. Yes. He was the ruler, so to speak, over all of them. So it was, I would say, easy for him to just influence them. But I can't see that because they were in the presence of a holy God. And he was able to convince one third. You know, so we might we got to be careful. Brother Destin, as we are studying Elder Morris' covetousness, Lucifer was selfish and he was covetous. True. And this overwhelmed him. And hence, he, he wanted he wanted to be like God. So he lead a rebellion because of his selfishness and his covetousness. He lead a rebellion against God. Okay, so going through this part of the lesson, you know, a question popped into my mind. Because I know we're touching on Lucifer and we're talking about all the things that, you know, he wanted basically God's position. That's who he was coveting, right? Yeah. And all the things he did afterwards in order to do so. Because, you know, when he was sent down to earth, he basically assumed his position as rule of the earth, definitely, right? Definitely, definitely. So, stepping away from that, you know, I want to ask a question. Is there a difference between covetousness and being inspired by someone? Is there a difference between coveting what someone has, with their position, their, their power? Is there a difference between that and being inspired by them to you know, want to aspire to be like them or to reach the heights that they make? Is there a difference? What do you think, my sister? Yes, I will say there is a difference. Okay. Because covet, coveting that person, whatever that person has, mean that we don't need it. We do not need it. And because that person has it, we are, we are inclined to want what he wants or what he has. And that is what this lesson warned us against, being covetous. Being covetous is basically being selfish, okay? True. Being covetous is being selfish. No two ways about it. So being, being coveted, coveting some, what someone has, it means that we have the feelings and desires for all that that person has, which we may not necessarily need. True, true. Whereas, whereas if, we, if we are aspiring to be like that person, <coughs> our aspiration must lead us to the foot of the cross to see what Jesus wants we need to do. What would Jesus like me to do? What, do I, what, would he, what, would, what should I do in this situation? So instead of greedily wanting to snatch what Brother Destiny and Sister Linda has, all I need to do is go to God because God is able to give according to our needs. Mm -hmm. My question is, do you think sin is an act or a thinking? So I like that you bring that up. Because in the, the section, in the Isaiah uh, section, the number one, one of the clues I put was heart. 
Because when it's talking about Lucifer, it says he purposed in his heart. That's the first thing he did. He had the idea in his heart. He didn't do anything yet. But then afterwards, where all the actions came. And I think when it comes to coveting, it's not really uh, action per se. Because we know coveting can lead to stealing. Coveting can lead to adultery. Coveting can lead to uh, a myriad of different sure. other sins. But when it comes to coveting, that's something that's in your heart. That's something that you could be coveting someone and they don't even know. Sure. So I think sure. when it comes to sin, and especially this sin, is definitely something that you deal with in your heart. Sure. For me, I would add to, um, before you do the act, before, before you even think about it, it's a sin. You don't even have to do the act. You, you engage in it, you think about it, it's a sin right there. Definitely. So now going on to if the section right below where we're going over Ephesians 5 verse 5 about what does Paul equate to covetousness, right? So I'll just go through Ephesians 5 5 quickly. It says, For this ye know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an adulterer hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and with God. And in those two uh, texts, also Colossians 3, 5, the one thing that's pointed out is that Paul highlights that being covetous is in the same line of being, of committing idolatry, which is solving other gods. Amen. Amen. So now going back to my initial question when I say, is there a difference between covetousness and being inspired? There is. And right below my question was answered. It says, how fascinating that twice Paul equates covetousness with idolatry. People practice idolatry when they worship. That is, dedicate their lives to something other than God. Something created rather than the creator. Could covetousness be, then, wanting something we shouldn't have, as Sister Hutchinson said, and wanting it so badly that our desire for it, rather than the Lord, become the focus of our heart. I think that's very powerful. That Amen. In other words, you go at the great, great lengths to get it. You will even commit murder yeah. to get it. So now to wrap up Sunday's lesson, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, I think this is a very good uh, text to wrap it up. It says, Godliness with content is great gain. And the question is, how can focusing on what Paul writes help protect us from covetousness? And I think, really and truly, with what we just touched on is that when our, we understand that our sole purpose and what we should strive for, so firstly, is what we can do in order to further God's word into the wall and also make sure that we are prepared and everything else that's going to be added unto us we are content with. So I think that's how Paul words can help protect us from covetousness. Any other words on Sunday's lesson before we continue? Okay, I just like the part where you, you, you read before we said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. I love that. If we do that, we can fall in no trouble. No Amen. problem at all. And if I may add, Paul's statement here is the key to spiritual growth and personal fulfillment. Amen. And now we are on Monday's lesson and a cursed thing in the camp. We know the story well of Israel, the Israelites, when they, when they captured Jericho and then were defeated by a tiny little place called Ai. Right? But that's... That's not, that's, not all, that's not all what this is about. When Joshua wanted to know what can he do, because no matter what he think, he didn't know how to capture Jericho. He went to Jehovah. Hallelujah. Joshua went to God, and God gave him the plan. And the plan that God laid out for Joshua was to march around Jericho seven times. Once per day, for seven days. And on the seventh, they are going to march around seven times. And on the seventh round, they are going to blow the trumpet. And 
At that point, the walls of Jericho fell, and Jericho was captured by the Israelites. God warned Joshua, though. He told Joshua, he told the Israelites not to take anything that was left in Jericho. The only thing that need to be taken was the things that belong into the temple. True. The gold, the silver, the bronze, etc. Nothing else. But Achan was greedy. He was covetous. True. And he went and he took several stuff from, from, the, from the looting in, in, in Jericho. He, he took a robe, a shina robe, the, the, the lessons told us. He took, he took some silver, he took gold, and he buried them in his tent. And what was so, what was so bad about Achan? Achan did not admit what he had done was wrong because it is all because of what he has done why Israel could not defeat Ai. As a matter of fact, when they scout out Ai, they, they told Joshua, just send up two to 3,000 men. Joshua did not consult God. Joshua did not consult God. And, you know, when, vict when, when you are victorious, don't let it get to your head because true. you didn't bring yourself victory. Victory comes only from God Almighty. So he did not contact with God, and he do as he liked. And he sent 3,000 men up. And imagine, Ai was a small place. 3,000 men was more than the men in Ai. Yet they had to run for their lives, and 36 of them were killed, according to the scriptures. When Joshua got to God, and you see, what he was supposed to do first, he, he did last. When he went to God, God told him about the accosting. Israel had sinned. God did not say Achan sinned. God said Israel sinned. So because Israel sinned, Israel could no longer represent God in their sinful state. Israel have to confess. Israel have to repent and then move forward in the name of Jehovah. No, my sister, I just have a question to ask. <clears throat> okay. I'm taking from Israel to us now. We are modern dear Israel, the church. What about, let's say, I sin? How does it affect the church? Ah, very good question. Your sin, Elder Paul, my sin, and all of our sin affected God's church. Okay. Because once we have sin in our lives, whilst once sin is in the camp, we cannot go out representing God effectively. That is so true. The, the, because in order for us to be effective, we must, we have to be, we have to be in unity. We have to be rooted. We have to be grounded. And we have to get rid of all the sin that in our lives. That is true. That is so uh, true. I have something to add. And you see in the context of this story, right, they're going to battle, right? Yes. And what we do when we go out into the wall and we try to win souls as battle, Right? Amen. And when they're going out, they're losing. And why they're losing? Because there's someone in the camp that's having a sin pulling them back. True. So now when we go out, spiritual battle, me and Brother Hall going out together, I may be having, I may have at a cost thing in my camp, mm -hmm. and that's holding us from winning souls because me now, I can't properly witness because of the sins that any of us may have. So I think that's definitely our two Brother Hall's question. That's how we links up to then and now, is that when there is a one sin, that may affect the entire, the entire church. The entire Amen. Israel. That is Amen. so true. And, and, and in order for us to be, to be effective, brethren, there isn't anything like honesty and integrity. True. When we are honest, Brother Harlan, Brother Destin going out, Brother Destin has an issue, Brother Destin know that he has committed an error. All brother have destined has to do be honest with himself. Brother Hall may not have known. And it is okay if Brother Hall doesn't know. However, Brother Destin know. And all Brother Destin has to do, go to God and cry out, that Father, is, have that is mercy true. That is true. on me and forgive me. And brethren, once we go to God, God forgive us. Amen. And that's the beauty about God. God doesn't hold anything against us. 
God does not hold anything against us when he forgives us. He casts it in the depth of the sea. Only mankind go and dive them up again. That is true. Okay? And, and in, with the story of, of Achan, yeah, after the powerful victory, Achan chose to sin. And what's, what's so, what was so disgusting about Achan, which can also be us today, is that he waited until he was found out. He did not admit. He, he did not, he did not, this could have ended differently. Was he honest with himself, honest with, with, with Joshua, honest with God, because Joshua did not know, but God knew. Because God knew all our sins, whether they are secret, whether they are, whether, whether they are public, God knows. So if he had gone to God, God would have dealt with it differently. And mind you, it, it comes down to the, the tribe by tribe until he reached to, 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 to Judah where Achan was a part of that and Achan was found out. That was when Achan admitted his folly. But then that was, that was a little late for him late was because late. God has already vindicated judgment against him because him and his entire family was stoned to death. The brethren, what we, what we see in this story of, of, of Achan, A.I. Joshua, and the accosting in the camp is that we must get rid of the accosting in our life. Get rid of the sin in our life. And we can do that. We can do it in our own strength. But when we go to God in humility, in honesty and sincerity, that sin, God will forgive and our end would be different. So by the, let us, by the grace of God, choose to obey God, choose to do his command, and do not compromise with anything that is sin. May God bless us. Amen. Tuesday lesson, the heart of Judas. I have a question here. Um, who among us doesn't struggle with covetousness over one thing or another? In this case, what he had covet was money and was covetousness a problem of the heart. Let him, let, le led him to stealing. Let's look at John 12, verses 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and brought that was put in the, in the, in the ring. Okay, if you, if you notice, the, the story is really about Judas. And hold on, before, <laughs> okay. I just want you to... Read the, the the one verse above it. Above it, he okay. asked the question, "Why why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor?" That's his question. So he's asking, "Why was it not sold for the amount of money, and why was it given to the poor?" That's the question he asked. Not the question. The reason he asked it, not because that you know he's thinking about the right. poor. He never think about no. the poor. He was a cook. <laughs> Judas was so full of himself. All Judas wanted was that money. You know, if, 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 the, if the ointment was sold for 300 as he recommended, he, he would have gotten some for himself because he was, he was carrying the bag with the money. He was the treasurer, so to speak. And he was dipping his hand in the Lord's money. Jesus knew all about it. But Jesus was offering Judas an opportunity to come clean, an opportunity to repent and save his soul. But if you notice the, the, this, the, the reading, here it said, Judas Iscariot, this man of a privilege that only 11 other people in history have. Come on. He was in the, the company of the, of the creator of the world. He was in the company you know, and my God, he was chosen. 
And at the same time, the reason why Jesus chose him to save him. And yet still, all what Judas was seeing is money. Uh, that's all he was seeing. Money all the way through. You know, well, if you notice the topic, why top, what did it, the, the memory text said? Memory text says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Exactly. <clears throat> and just imagine, May, Mary was, Mary saved up our one ear with her wages. Oh, yes. To buy that anointment. Mm -hmm. And and she bite to as come to Jesus. Jesus said, He bite to prepare for my burial. You know, she bite especially to prepare for my burial. And when when Judas smell the the, 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 the the what will you call it now? Fragrance. The fragrance. <laughs> Judas said, Man, this thing could soul and give to the poor. Judas never have the poor in mind. All that Judas have in mind was just his pocket. And Jesus gave him all the chance in the world to repent. But he could never sigh. And he, he loved money so much that he went away and sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I, I took the privilege of, 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 of looking up this ointment. Okay. And the name of it was his spank nerd. And, and it, it said it was a very excellent and it is still today very it is a very valued will. and expensive will. and sweet perfume okay you know so so when when this when mary opened it the smell just hit through us he knew what this was True. he knew what this was and then all he could think about is what he could have gained True. from it True. not judas said and i and jesus said to him Leave Mary alone. Ooh. She has prepared, she's preparing me for my burial. Right. The poor you always have with you. And today, Ooh. the poor is still with us. Still with us. And all we need to do is to take what Jesus gives to us and help the poor. True. That it is, is so part true. of the mission of our church. True. It, and it is what we are supposed to do to help others. Not to be like Judas. Not, not, not to be covetous and selfish like him but to share what we have with others. That is so true. Okay. When's the lesson now? An Ananias and Sophia. The reading said, it was an exciting time to be a member of the church. Following the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the apostles were preaching the gospel with power. Thousands were joining the church. And when they had prayed, the place were shaken. And where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of what? One heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that out of the things which we he possessed was his own, but they, they had all things common. Amen. What a privilege Adonis and Sophia had. Being part of the early church, seeing its growth, seeing the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and in such a marked manner, nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were, were possessed of land and house, sold them and brought the proceed of the things which were sold and laid them at the apostle feet. And they distribute each as one had need. In, it, was, it was in this setting that An Ananias and Sapphira, obviously impressed by what was happening and wanting to be part of it, decided to sell some property and contribute the proceed to the church. So far, so good. You see, they decided to sell what they have, or some of their property. But at the same time, when they sold the property and see how much money they get, then it was 
grudgeful come in. So I have a question, right? Because there's a question that that was asked, that Peter asked before they both, you know, well, it was Ananias uh, dropped down, right? He asked, while it remained, now this is in reference to they're selling the land and coming to Peter and saying, this is the amount you sold it for, right. for lying. And he asks, while it remained, was it, not in thine, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why dost conceive these things in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto man, but unto God. Mm. And the question asks, what do you think was worse? Holding back part of the money or lying about it? Right, and he asks why such a harsh punishment. But you know, from hearing the story over and over, um, I get the impression that it was in their right to decide however much they wanted to give. That's how I see it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that you know, if they sold it for five thousand and they wanted to give four thousand, and that that was in their right. So I just want to know: so is this? Am I looking at this the right way? Yes, Brother Hazel, I, I think that is exactly the way that, that, that how you said it. Because, you know, what was going on there among the brethren, among the disciples and the folks, no one was left out. Brother Hall would sell all that he has and he bring it. And he gave to Brother Jupiter, not, not, not even he gave, the disciples, any, any sales or anything happened, they bring it together. And they give to all those who are in need. Exactly. And and that's how that's how the, that's how God's people were being taken care of then. And God expects us to do the same. However, Ananias and Sapphira conspired to lie. When they lie, little did they know that they were lying against the Holy Ghost. And 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 the Holy Ghost was revealing to Peter everything that was happening. True. So, so therefore, it was, it was, I think, it was more dangerous to lie than even holding back, back part of the money. As Ella Hazel said, while they sold whatever possession they had, it was theirs it was to decide what and how they are going to do it. So, so lying about it, lying it. against the Holy, Holy Spirit, the punishment was harsh. harsh. Why because why it, was it harsh? Because God wants us to know that dishonesty and covetousness is destructive to his children. You want to say something? Sin keeps us away from God. Okay. You see, I really have to look back, look on the, the, the question my brother still asked. What do you think was worse? Holding back part of the money or lying about it? And Sister Ochi answered so perfect. Lying about it. You know? And if you notice the reading say, at first it seems as if they were sincere in their desire to give towards the work. However, after Ananias and Sapphira grieved the Holy Spirit, by yielding to the feeling of covetousness, they began to regret their promise and soon lost the sweet influence of the blessing that they had worn their heart with the desire to enlarge things in on behalf of Christ. Amen. They lied. And you know the thing about it? The church was young at that time. Oh, yes. It was young. People was just adding towards the church daily. As continue reading, thousands of people were adding towards the church. You know, they have everything in common. Mm -hmm. And boy, you got to be careful what we really do. Trust me. Thought she was going to say something? Okay. I'm going to just move on to Thursday. Overcoming covetousness. Overcoming covetousness. Covetousness is a matter of the art. And like pride and selfishness, often goes unnoticed. 
which is why it can be so deadly and deceiving. It's hard enough overcoming sin. It had it hard enough overcoming sin that are obvious lying, adultery, stealing, idolatry, Sabbath breaking. But these are outward acts. Things that we have to think about before we do them. But to overcome wrong thought themselves, that's get tough. Amen. First Corinthians 10 verse 13 said, What promise is given here? And why is this so important to understand in the context of covetousness? So I'll go ahead and read that. Okay. That says, there, sorry, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is to common man, such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what ye are able, but will the tempt, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Okay, so in other words, if any temptation come our way, there's a way of escape. Because God already provided for us. So, so we could overcome it then. That's what the scripture is saying. We could overcome it. So if we choose not to overcome it, it's our choice. But everything is about choice. Hello. Um, the promise, God promised to help us resist temptation. And he does so by different means. And I'm going to read a few of them here that I have written down. Okay. He, he does so by helping us to recognize these people and the situations that give us trouble. This is how God helps us to escape, okay? Because he promised. This is his promise to us. Okay. So he promised to help us to recognize the, the people and the situation that brings trouble to us. Okay. Secondly, he said to us, said, we must run away, run, run away from anything that is wrong. That is Jesus helping us. He also said us, choose to do only what is right. And God, God helps us with that because he gave us the power to choose. And number four, he said, to, he said we must pray for God's help and seek friends who love God. And can offer help when we are tempted. Okay, so wonderful. God helps us in this situation. So all we need to do when we are tempted, we know that temptation is not a sin, but yielding to temptation is a sin. So God provides mechanisms for us to seek him so that we can overcome the enemy. Okay. In our own strength, we are powerless for him. But with Jesus in our vessel, with Jesus on our side, we can overcome through the blood of the Lamb. Okay, it was Philippians 4 verse 13 said, I can do all things through Christ. Strengthen me. Amen. How then, can, how then in God's power can we, can we be protected against this dangerous, deceptive sin? And we have three Three outline here. It said, make a decision to serve and depart, depend on God, and to do and to be part of his family. Choose you this day whom we will serve. Number two said, be daily in prayer and include Matthew 6, verse 13, which said, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. We should really put that in our prayer for some of, some of the time we really pass through some serious temptation. Amen. We really have to ask God to stand by our side. And number three say, be regular in Bible study. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Amen. What if any of you been what if any have been the consequence in your own life from covetousness? What lesson have you learned? What might you still 
need to learn from them. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thought. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. 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 I think before we go on to Friday and we wrap up, in answer to that question, you know, it brings me back to what we spoke about with coveting and it taking up so much of your life. So you know that, you know, when I was younger and you would see, you know, sorting, you know, pairs with like, you know, like a sorting game, like that just take over you, like that's all you want. Mm. Till is that, you know, you just, you know, that's all you could think about. That's all you could ask. That's all I could ask my parents for. It's like you, you so wish that you could have even been that person so you could play the game that they have. Then as when you get older, you realize, you know, things of this world, you know, the lavish life, all those different things that, you know, some of us, you see and you think that it is so good, but you understand that some of these persons, you know, they don't even want their own lives. They don't think that it's even worth it to be alive. You understand that, you know, when you are content in who you are and what you have, that you can really find peace and peace in God indeed. Amen. 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 And brethren, we must be consistent. We must be constant. And we must be grateful and thankful for whatever God has blessed us with. Amen. Amen. And, to, and to bring our well-spent time to a close. In the conquest of Jericho, Achan was not the only man carrying silver and gold back to the camp of Israel. Joshua had told the men to bring back the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron and the treasury of the house of God. Everything else was to be burned. Achan, however, was the only man to keep something for himself. Ouch. Of the millions of Israel, of Israel, there was but one man who in that solemn hour of triumph and of judgment had dared to transgress the command of God. Achan's covetousness was excited by the sight of that costly robe of Shinar. Even when it had brought him face to face with death, he called it a goodly Babylonianish garment. Ouch. One sin led to another, and he appropriated the gold and silver devoted to the treasury of the Lord. He robbed God of the first fruit of the land of Canaan. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 496. In Paul's list of signs of the last days, the first two items involve our attitude towards money and possession. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, covetous, self 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. Selfishness and love of money are significant descriptions of humanity in the last days, our day. So let us, by the grace of God, do not let material things and money take our focus from God. Let, they not, let us not make them our idols, taken away from our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But with the help and by the grace of God, we will walk in his principles, in his statutes, and keep his judgment so that when he comes, all of us will be saved. None of us would be left out. To God be the glory. And we thank God for the gift of love, for the gift of life, for his words that, we, that was so ably discussed this evening. God, we pray that you would Open the minds of our understanding and help us to live by your principles, knowing that you are there for us and to help us and to protect us, to provide for us. Because you say you would, give, you would provide all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Amen.
And we thank you for joining us this week. And we pray that you have a wonderful week upcoming. And join us again next time. God bless. Amen. Amen.